Welcome to the Ikus Unscripted Podcast, powered by Jägermeister. We are joined by the living legend of the comic book industry. He was born in Brooklyn 76 years ago with love for comics and went on to win Inkpot and many other awards. And today he stands in Will Eisner Hall of Fame. One of the revolutionaries that proved that teenagers can be superheroes and paved the way for generations of new cartoonists. He is the creator or co-creator of, among others, some of the most beloved heroes like Cyborg. Nova, Blade, Starfire, Raven, Tim Drake, infamous villains like Bullseye or Deathstroke, and he penned The Tomb of Dracula, The New Teen Titans, and The Crisis of Infinite Earths, and many other notable series, one and only Marv Bullman. Thank you for being here, Mr. Wolfman, and are you ready to go genuine, uncensored, and unscripted with us today? I will do my best. Thank you for asking. Yeah. Okay, Mr. Wolfman. Do you recall your first comic book experience? And can you tell our listeners why and how you went from being a fan to being a writer? Okay, the um, start, I think I was about six or seven. Uh, I was at a friend's house in the days that TVs did not have remote controls. So if you've gone to, uh, we were watching a kid show, a famous kid show at the time, and we were going to get up and walk to the TV and change the channel once it was over. But before we could do it, a new show started, and it turned out to be The Adventures of Superman, which we had never heard of. Um, but it looked interesting from the opening credits, and we watched it, and at the very end, it said Superman is uh, based on the... Uh, based on the comic book character uh, in Superman and Action Comics Monthly, and the two of us got up, walked to the corner where there was a newsstand, and bought our first Superman comics. Wow. Yeah, that's that's a story. So it was basically almost a coincidence, right? Uh, that you didn't. It, it's yeah. totally a coincidence. It, it was lucky, um, because otherwise, if we did, if I wasn't lazy, I never would have uh, got, uh, <laughs> you know. Yeah. So uh, nothing. Like, saw the show. So if you if you weren't lazy, nothing. No crisis on infinite earths. No yeah. Superman stories. Nothing. Yeah, no some people some people would be happy that there was no crisis, but I'm not one of them. I love the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, I well I doubt there would be many of those those kind of people. But uh, today, it would seem more than odd that not to include uh, credits in one's work. But actually, back in your time, you were among the first writers who got his name in writing credits. Uh, so as the writing credits pioneer, can you describe me that feeling reading for the first time, Wandering Wolfman? <laughs> it was, you know, the, uh, Jerry, that was in a book called House of Mystery or House of Secrets. I forget which one it was. Um, I think it was House of Secrets. And... In between all the stories, there's a one-page little uh, called an interstitial. And the writer who wrote that page knew I was writing the story that followed. So he put in the joke, the following is told to me by a wandering wolfman. And unfortunately, at the time, the Comic Code Authority, which governed comic books, did not allow werewolves or Draculas or vampires or any or wolfmen and told them, they couldn't, uh, they'd had to change that joke. And they said, no, that's actually his name. It's his <laughs> real name. Uh, and they said, well, if it's his real name, it has to be on the credits as written by. Mm -hmm. So I actually have the page on my wall. Let's see if I could, oh, I'll have to switch it. But um, yeah. it's on my wall and uh, with my credit line that they sent to the printer to wow. uh, put on it. Yeah, that's amazing memorabilia there. Yeah, yeah. You, you could sell that for, for a lot of money. <laughs> but don't. <laughs> don't, never. You, you know, I have one of the things that I read. You, you uh, DC published your first work in 1968, if I'm correct. So that I think is... it was 67, but I, met, uh, I think it was at the end of 67. But by the yeah. time it came out, it was uh, mm -hmm. probably 68. Yeah, so 
that's basically like uh, 55, 56 years ago, give or take. Uh, in between that time, comic books, obviously, the world changed, but obviously, as of the world, comic books change imminently uh, in a various different ways. As someone who got to witness all that, uh, tell me, what is how different is for you to look back at the, that time and do you have maybe favorite era of comic books that you just not just as a writer but maybe as a fan enjoyed the works from that time is there such such thing well obviously when i was growing up that affects you the most when you're 10 12 14 years old that's when you absolutely love uh love the comics and those are the books that will stay in your memory forever once you turn a pro, turn into a professional, you're so busy writing this stuff, you don't read as much as you used to. You don't have you don't have that ability to always enjoy everything as much. The early uh, DC comics and um, were phenomenal when I was eight, nine, ten years old. I just loved Superman. I loved Batman, and I read Wonder Woman. Um, the but I love those books. And then just as I was starting to get tired of some of the comics, in came the Fantastic Four and Spider-Man, whereas the DC books at the time period were uh, were meant for 8 to 12-year-olds. The Marvel books started at probably 13 or 14 and up. Um, yeah. DC moved as well, but by that point, uh, Marvel had already made its point, made its debut, and those were written more closer for my age at the time. So I really loved them as well. Um, I read all the uh, different types of comics. It didn't matter to me if it was a superhero or Casper the Friendly Ghost or Archie comics. I read them if it was done in comic book form, uh, and just loved that stuff. Um, and after a while, um, I uh, you know, uh, times changed, as you said, and it was the new books that were coming in were now more adult, and now I was an adult. So again, the comics sort of uh, aged with me, so I was able to enjoy uh -huh. every decade or so of comics. Yeah. Uh, if I'm right, you, all, you said in one of your interviews that Fantastic Four was your favorites uh, were your favorite superheroes at the time and uh, stan lee created fantastic four just in the right time for you to read them and when stan lee passed away you said your goodbyes to him thanking him for his legacy in comic book industry and without a shadow of a, of a doubt stan is the number one man in this industry that ever was and you grow up reading his comics fantastic four like you said and later you got a chance to work with him, if I'm correct. And when you yes. wrote down Nova and stuff like that, uh, could you please relive your first time meeting Stan Lee for us? How was it to work with him? First of all, Stan is Stan, Stan is a very outgoing, very friendly, and very smart guy and really talented. I got to work with him. I was the editor-in-chief at Marvel, so I got to work with him with just the two of us in a room. He was wow. always on top of everything. He he was he really did know what he was doing, and he he made it so much fun. He had that ability that some people have, I certainly do not, where they meet you and you instantly like them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're funny, they're nice, they're all of that, and Stan was that type of person. Really liked him. Uh, every time as an editor, I needed some advice, I would ask him and he had the answer immediately and it was always the correct one. And his writing was great. Um, people look at it now, six, 50 years after Fantastic Four debuted, of course the writing has changed. So have we. We're now 50, 60 years older. Uh, and it's unfair to take today's quality and say, well, he didn't do that. He was better than anyone at the time period. Yeah. And he created more characters that all of us love than anybody. So uh, I'm a big fan of Stamps. Yeah, but you had also your fair share of creating characters. And when you created Nova, did maybe Stanley, you said you worked with him alone, you uh, two of you in the office. Did he maybe impacted some of uh, Nova moments in that uh, series you done? 
Well, the only thing at that particular point, I think Stan was more on uh, the movie side of stuff and the TV mm -hmm. side of stuff, but I was still working with him and I showed him uh, Nova, uh, st told him all about it. And I said, the only problem I have with it is that Nova sounds like a female name and I don't know what to do. And he just instantly in one second said, call the book, The Man Called Nova. And that will get rid of it from that point on. So Stan was able to help that as well. Yeah, that's great. Great story. And uh, you, you said how Stan, Stan's stories are universal, but I can tell you, I read uh, A Man Called Nova very recently. And I can say that, say that that is really a universal story that we can see coming uh, to life on the big screen even today. I would love to see that. Uh, the thing about Nova was... I was well at the same time I was writing Nova. I was writing Tomb of Dracula, so I was uh, writing a, a the one of the oldest skewing books that DC had, and I felt that we were getting a little bit away from the Spider Mans and Fantastic Four, which were big fun books, and I wanted to create a big fun book, and that was the purpose of Nova was to go back to those early days of Marvel and try to find out why those books worked and then not copy it, a brand new character, or all new stuff, but understood what he did and then incorporated to this time period that the Nova came out in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the creation of the character and you, you created so many, uh, I feel today as a comic book reader, that I don't know, like characters get created, but I don't think that they get uh, momentum, so to speak. Uh, and I think a lot of times, you know, publishers drop the ball on you know, even some cool designs and concepts. Uh, what, in your opinion, makes a character grow, uh, keep that momentum, you know, uh, get standard in the, in the comics? I think before you start writing and drawing a comic, you really have to make sure who the character is, what does the character like, why is this character unique, are people going to like him? You sit down and you work out all of these details, you work out the backstory of the character so there's going to be a lot that you could use over many years. Sometimes you, you may create a couple pages worth of notes that you won't use for four years because you have to get to that point. You have to get to the point where Richard Ryder is go going to reveal to his parents who he is and that he's the man called Nova, but you're not gonna see that for a year or two. But you have to know these things so you are planting clues that things are gonna keep going and people are interested if they have an idea that you're creating something that's getting bigger or changing or moving, it's not gonna be the same every single month. And they also like characters essentially that they have to like. Uh, even a villain can be likable. I mean, you can really enjoy it. Deathstroke is, I think, one of one of the better ones that I've done. And he's certainly not a good guy, but you sort of Definitely. like the character because of what he is and his, his own senses. So it's important, I believe, to have, um, have a character that the readers can enjoy reading and not go, they're so disgusting, you know, more like yeah. fun. Even ah, the yeah. even the bad guys. Yeah, now, now that you mentioned that, uh, in uh, one of my favorite parts on uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths is Dark Side actually, uh, and obviously he's a very bad guy, uh, but he has to be play with the with the good guys right now. And I remember uh, like uh, when they thank him for his help. You know, he says one of the I think most badass quotes ever. Uh, you don't owe me nothing, but one day you will surely pay. <laughs> that was like, yeah, I, I remember that fondly, that part of the comic yeah. book. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. And you created so much uh, iconic characters, but are any of them based or influenced by the real life people, your family, colleagues, friends? And between all of them, who would be the one with whom you relate the most? Most? Uh, no, none of them are based on anybody. Uh, what I do is I sit down and say, what does this 
what does the hero need to battle? Why is this character you connected directly to the hero in some fashion? I'm not saying they are related or anything like that, but yeah. what is it about the hero and villain that they that they become sparring partners and make sense? Uh, all too often, a pe uh, people write create a character, but there's no reason the character is in this book. It's just that they came up with a character, so they're going to put it in there. You need to actually figure out why this character is good for this hero, this villain is good. An example to explain what I was, uh, what I mean by all of this, is I was writing Daredevil. I wrote it for about two years or three years, and I wanted to create a villain for Daredevil because he hadn't really had great villains in the past. They were all sort of bizarro type villains. But so I started to think, what is Daredevil's superpower? He has this thing called radar vision. He can sense when things are around him or attacking him or stuff of that sort. Spider-Man calls a Spidey sense Daredevil had radar ability. Same, same difference. So how do you prevent Daredevil from knowing he's being attacked? If he can sense something, if he could sense a villain about to uh, shoot him, how does Daredevil react? Well, what if you can create a character who could be a half a mile away? What if you create a character who Daredevil cannot see? Suddenly this character is unique and he's designed for Daredevil as opposed to just a villain that appears in Daredevil. Yeah, natural enemy. Mm, yeah, now that you mention it, uh, uh, did, did, did you watch uh, the Daredevil, the Netflix uh, Daredevil? Yeah, I uh, enjoyed I it. Thought it. Yeah, uh, I think right now what you're explaining, I remember the actually fight scene. It was a great fight scene that they did in the third season in the dark room, Daredevil against the, the Bullseye. And I think it just... Uh, uh, you know, touches on what you just said, you know, how they are natural enemies and now Daredevil has to adapt to him and uh, his fighting yeah. style. So, yeah, that's a very, very, very interesting philosophy on, on villain and hero dynamic. What was the atmosphere when you came up with the idea of Blade, the, one of the first uh, black characters? And you also created uh, Starfire, which was also the black character. What was the atmosphere in US between the fans and everything? Back then, I um, never, never got any comments negatively or positively. They just liked the character, um, yeah. and uh, I didn't think of it as a black vampire hunter. Though I had intended my next character to be African American, I wanted that because there weren't enough of them. And where I went to school, the school was divided pretty equally, so I was used to having people from very different countries and very different places. And I didn't see why we couldn't do that in comics. Uh, yeah. First try to sell a black character to DC, but that didn't work out. Um, and then I decided the next character I create will definitely be black. But the fans never had any negative negatives or positives. I mean, they just liked the character, but they didn't bring up the fact that he was black. So I don't know if that had any effect on him. Now, Starfire, you mentioned Starfire. Starfire in the comics was actually golden skin. She was sort yeah. of a, a cat-like fur. Um, yeah, I mean, herself. she's an alien. In the, in yeah, the TV show, she uh, she's played, uh, she is black. And I think the actress who does it, does her wonderfully, uh, really beautifully. I'm sorry that the show has just been canceled. Yeah, Titans have been cancelled. Yeah, I saw your reaction actually on, on that, you know, but uh, uh, obviously you you had a job back then with the new Titans and it became one of the legendary runs. Uh, obviously you and George Perez uh, done an amazing job, uh, but uh, w was the series everything that you hoped for, uh, you know, everything that you envisioned for that characters, for those characters? The Titans, uh, are you asking if uh, the Titans was everything I would hope for or uh, the yeah. individual? The, the TV show, did you, uh, you know, did you like it in the terms of uh, your writing? Did you imagine them on the big screen like that or the small screen TV? I always thought Blade could be a movie uh, right from day one because 
he he didn't have superpowers per se. Um, so back in a time when the special effects weren't that good, all you needed is a vampire crumbling to ash, and that wasn't hard to do. But there weren't a lot of other special effects. So I always thought that he was a character who could do it as a movie. And I thought when I saw the first one, I thought it was great. I thought he, I thought Wesley Snipes was absolutely perfect as Blade. I mean, I, he's a pop culture icon for that, just for that role only, not the others, not to mention the others. Yeah, the uh, I met uh, Wesley on the set of Blade. Uh, I, w I was there on the first opening day of uh, shooting, and uh, the only. He was very nice. He was incredibly nice to me. The only thing he um, asked was Blade was Blade Black in the comic books. He had never seen the ca the comic, so uh, he didn't know. And I, and knowing that some of the people there were, I had a copy of uh, Bla uh, Dracula with the first Blade, and I showed it to him, and he was thrilled that the character preceded him as Black, and he wasn't hired just to be different. He was hired because he was ex he was this character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, what do you think uh, Maher Shalali is supposed to play him? I, I believe he's going to do a splendid job as well. Do you think so? I hope so. Um, you know, uh, Marvel doesn't tell me what they're doing, so I have no idea. I, I would hope he's a good actor. I really enjoyed him on Luke Cage. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, he brings that realism to um, uh, to Blade. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I tend to ask if Marvel or Disney approached you about because about Nova because Nova is one of the most anticipated movies or series to be made by, uh, by fandom. But speaking about all of your adaptations, Teen Titans Go are are really su successful, and you even appeared together with uh, now late uh, George Perez on the show, and you had a cameo, a cameo in Arrowverse as yourself. But what's your opinion seeing your uh, your characters presented in one new way, especially when fundamental stuff somewhere like origins are changed? How do you look on that? Well, first, uh, on the Marvel side, no, they've never called me on anything. So uh, I wish I would. I would love to work with Shame them. Shame on, on them, a, to be yeah. honest. Um, I think it would be really good uh, for the fans if uh, this would, could, could move smoothly. Um, I've been very lucky. Uh, I can't say that I disliked any of the films or TV shows based on my characters. And I'm the first one who should not, who should have problems with it. As the creator, I should see all the things that are, that are different. But in almost every case, they have done things where they've made changes. They made it within the feel and the scope of the characters. So I've had no problems about any of the changes. Uh, that they've uh, that they've made in any of the characters, uh, but again, one of the things is I wrote comic books. My comic books are on my shelf, and those are my versions of the characters. Now it's up to other people to adapt. And why do I have not? Why do I have no problem with it? Well, I came in and I wrote Superman. I didn't create Superman. Yeah. I wrote Batman. I didn't create Batman. So I made changes all the time. I, I made Robin into quit being the Batman and uh, yeah. become Nightwing. So I really couldn't complain when somebody does the same thing to me that I do to others. Uh, but I've been very lucky that they've done everything that I've worked on with a lot of respect. Mm, yeah. I mean, uh, obviously, uh, now that you mentioned uh, what changes to your characters and the characters that you made changes to, I have read. Uh, your uh, Superman's storyline, Man and Superman, that uh, was published in 2019, if I'm correct. Uh, and actually, I read your foreword, uh, like, where uh, before the comic book, your thoughts on it. And it was actually just as entertaining as the comic book itself. Uh, and, you know, you, you presented there your uh, philosophy on Superman, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I... Uh, obviously you said he's, he's your favorite character. I was always, you know, here and there with Superman, to be honest, but uh, let me ask you this. I always considered him as a fan, just 
as one of the most complex characters to write. Was it like that with you? Uh, or, and if not, what was the character that you had uh, most, let's call it, trouble? Yakuza. Um, I never had problems with Superman. I've written many different takes on Superman over the years, depending upon what the editor was looking for. Uh, Man and Superman, which I think is my favorite, and I really love that book. It's um, it, thank you. Um, I think that's my definitive version of the character. Uh, and he was never a problem to me. I, he was a character that I was able to write the moment I thought of, uh, thought about it. Anytime I had a story, I could make that work with Superman. Uh, re about three weeks ago, uh, my latest Superman story came out in a book called uh, Kalo Returns. It has four stories in it, and I wrote one of them, and I'm really happy with that Superman too. But that's the Superman with Lo married to Lois with a kid. So since that was the version I was asked to write, I was able to find things that made him the character I love. I'm I try to be consistent with the character, even though I move with the times. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, speaking of that uh, and movie versions, we saw many versions of Superman. Uh, we saw Christopher Reeve and Brendan Ruth and, uh, you know, Henry Cavill. Uh, I personally am the biggest fan of Man of Steel out of all Superman films. Uh, which one is your uh, favorite iteration? I think the first one uh, with Christopher Reeve. Um, he represented the goodness in Superman. And I think that's that's something that can... Too many people, when they feel that uh, you say Superman's a good guy, they think he's boring. Not at all. He just makes the right decisions. He still struggles. He still has problems. He still has all the things that all people have. But he's going to do the right thing because it is the right thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I always felt that uh, Christopher Ray was best uh, Clark Kent. You know, he played the best part of the Clark Kent, I believe. Even Henry Cavill, although Man of Steel, like I said, is my favorite time. Uh, he didn't present Clark Kent, I believe, as good as uh, Christopher Ray. Well, Clark, I, I like his take on Superman tremendously. Clark, they obviously wanted to do a little bit more of the 1938 Clark, who was a little bit crazy. Uh, not, not this not always, um, you know, rugged and such. Uh, but his Superman I loved, and I just, I thought it worked out beautifully. Luca spoke about why Superman is, he thought was challenging to write, and, and all those adaptations in movies you mentioned of Superman. And I really uh, loved Injustice series. I don't know if you read them, when uh, they turned Superman into villain. And that was a whole new aspect of Superman to me, he being a ruthless totalitarian di dictator. I think Have you read it? Do... What's the book? Injustice. No, I didn't read it. Um, I tend not to read uh, a lot of books these days, only especially on characters that I like, because mm -hmm. nobody else can write the character that I like the way I like it. Yeah, that well, comes <laughs> out in my head. Um, yeah. so that's a little bit of an ego, but I know, I understand it. Uh, but what no, about the, but that's, but a, what... that's a single storyline. That's a self-contained mm -hmm. novel. Yeah. Uh, separate universe. Totally. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter. Uh, it's a what if, mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, as long as it's a good story, those are fine. But as part of standard continuity, uh, Superman's not a villain. He never would be. Yeah. He was raised by two very nice people, to, mm -hmm. and he became a good person because of it. Yeah, but uh, it, it's like when Cap said Hail Hydra in Secret Empire, yeah. and we found out that isn't the real Cap, and you know, right. but it broke the internet. <laughs> it's a good storyline. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you said that you do not follow all of those characters today, but do you follow the characters you created, like Nova, like uh, Teen Titans, uh, uh, Blade? 
what do you think about the writers? Uh, the, what do you think about their adaptations today? And do those writers contact you to ask for your opinion, maybe, or your advice? Okay. First, I never, and haven't since the days of Dracula, read anybody else's version of my characters. Wow, wow. really? I do. I have never done that unless I have to for an assignment, like uh, I'm doing a sequel story or something of that sort. But no, I never read it. Because if I created it, I have their speech patterns in my head. Nobody can read my head. That means the character is never, no matter how well written it is, it's never going to be the character that I see. So it, all the other writers are, are friends of mine. Why should I who I'm writing Superman and I didn't check with Jerry Siegel to find out if it's okay to do stuff. Why should they have to ask me? They should just do the job they're doing. They in fact, shouldn't be copying me. They should be, because I did this because I felt it was the right thing to do as, as well as they should. Hopefully they'll make the right decisions and keep the character growing and changing over years. Yeah, and I also wanted to get a first-hand insight from you when those big crossovers uh, happen, like Crisis on Infinite Earth in your time. How are those storylines created? Because, uh, backstage, do you meet with uh, publishers, with editors, with other writers that their characters are involved into your stories, or you just go on and... Go on. <laughs> You do what needs to be done depending upon the characters you're working with. Again, if it was Superman, uh, I understand the character very well. Mm -hmm. And I have it, I have my view of what Superman is, and that's I don't have to ask anybody else. If I were doing um I don't know, uh Green Lantern, but one of the later Green Lanterns uh that say Ron Mars or one of the others did, I don't know them as well. So I would actually, I would go out of my way to ask what makes this character tick, what works. It, it really depends upon who the character is and such. Otherwise, I just try to tell the story that I'm, I believe in. Yeah, yeah. And I, I just wanted to know because, you know, you, we now have these one or two big story, uh, big crossovers in a year, like especially in Marvel, which has whole this schedule of, uh, and a different writers, one in, is writing Thor, one is writing Venom, one is writing Hulk, and all those, all those heroes are combined into one storyline. And I was always curious if there's maybe conflict if one wants to do this with uh, that hero, one wants to go it this way and stuff like that. You're dealing with a lot of creators like myself with very strong egos because we mm -hmm. have to have that in order to navigate through how it's selling books every single month and being told the book doesn't story doesn't work or whatever else. So you have to have a strong ego to be able to do it. Um, I think you do the, you do the job that you do. You're going to have arguments with the other creators because they, I have my view as Superman. They have their view as Superman. Yeah. But if I'm writing it, I'm going to write it the way I believe in it. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but uh, obviously like something like, uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths, which, you know, changed, obviously, famous, infamously in DC. It's pre-crisis, post-crisis. Uh, like, uh, you worked on it, and you worked with George Perez. Uh, you had a long-time collaboration. Uh, for a storyline that big, uh, how do you, like, uh, for him, who has to draw so many characters, uh, how did you collaborate with him on that? What is the teamwork like uh, in, in writing such a huge story? Well, first, uh, when when I proposed the book and started writing it, there was no artist attached to it. Yeah, uh, I read George, it. George was going on to another book he wanted to do, but we were still doing some Titan stuff, and we were friends anyway. Uh, George lived five blocks from me, uh, so we we'd get together for lunch all the time. And um, I would always, he'd ask how, how my book was doing, uh, how, how the story was coming along. And I kept telling him. And one day he comes to DC and says, I got to do it. I got to draw it. I said, thank God, you're the only one who could do it right. Uh, it, 
the plot took a long time. It's it's not something you can throw out on a monthly basis. And I think that's why it works. I took the time and I was given the time that I could take to find all the mistakes and plant more clues. I could, if I know that I have a great idea for say the Alexander Luther character, and I am going to reveal it in issue seven. So on my little chart, I'll put, just put Alexander Luther in issue seven. That means in, maybe in issue five, I should give a major clue. So I'll put clue to, then maybe in issue three, I should just have a brief mention, sort of like, it's just an accident that I'm mentioning it, you, but I already know where it's going. Mm -hmm. So it, putting together a story that big is figuring out all the pieces and it's like a jigsaw puzzle. You have to figure it out and what each piece is gonna make, how each piece is gonna make it stronger. Mm -hmm. yeah. And in Crisis on Infinite Earths, when did you know that you will take out Barry Allen? <laughs> um, DC asked me right from day one. That one wasn't my decision, it was DC's. Mine was really? Supergirl. Um, uh, I'm not sure why, I just, and I kept trying to talk them out of it, which is why for six issues or seven issues, you just see him sort of like as a ghost character. Because I kept trying to uh, delay killing him to see if I could change it. But at the same time, if I, uh, assuming I had to kill him, I want to make sure it was really an important, uh, an important death. That, wow. And create the whole mystery of crisis all around him. Yeah, I mean, that death is uh, one of the most, I believe, iconic in the comics. And especially because you know death in comics are not long standing but that death you know it re took really a long time for us to see Barry Allen again and also what it gave chance for character of Wally West later to take off as a flash and i think it did wonders for his character uh so that that is like probably one of the most important i believe the dc did the right thing but you did the right uh, by giving him an epic death it had to be it had to be if he was going to die, it had to be important because he was the first Silver Age hero. And yeah. I did not want anything but the best if I had to do it. So it took me a long time to figure that one out. And fortunately, again, I could plan it. That was going to be in issue eight. So in issue eight, Barry dies. In issue six, on my chart, something happens. Issue four, something happens. So I could follow track everything that leads to issue eight yeah 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 did, did, did you uh did you and george uh realize obviously you proposed the idea for you know settling settling the, the universe but did you kind of uh when you were closing to the end of the story did you know how much could you foresee how much impact it would uh had on the complete industry no not at all um i thought of I thought what we were doing was to to set up major changes for DC and that people would only be concerned about the changes. I didn't think, so we were like a road map. We were on the map and the destination is all the new stuff at DC. And that's what you're really going for is that, but you have to take the trip there and crisis was the trip there. It turned out, because of various things, that crisis and just a lot of hard work, really, uh, that crisis became something that everyone really had strong opinions on, whether they loved it or they hated it. Yeah, yeah but I mean, whether someone loved that storyline or hated that storyline or felt something something in between, it's undeniable that it's historically important, uh, you know, storyline in the in yeah. the comic books it's well nobody had ever nobody had ever done a story that did what we did first of all every single character at dc was in it in one way or another and characters changed and you know our little advertising slogans uh worlds live worlds dies no you know uh became true and the crisis became the book that everybody was talking about and I'm very thankful because I put a lot of work into it. Yeah, yeah. And 
and storyline like Crisis on Infinite Earth became the trendsetter because uh, also years later, decades later, even Marvel did star, uh, Secret Wars, the, the DC did the Rebirth, and all those stuff happens uh, thanks to Crisis on Infinite Earth, actually. Yeah, it still influences, uh, you know, comics in, in a mm -hmm. great way, you know. It's, you know, we did it because of a, we had a reason for doing Crisis. To re, uh, uh, it, we had a very strong reason for doing it. Not We didn't know if it would sell or not, but mm -hmm. there was a real reason to do it for DC. And sometimes a lot of crossovers are done because they have to do two or three crossovers in a year. Nobody had ever done it before. And the fact that it sold so well meant that everyone was going to start copying that. Yeah. yeah, I feel that because, like uh, Petr mentioned, I mean, uh, right now you are on schedule. You have to do crossover uh, a year or two crossovers a year. Uh, while you did it because it was necessary, uh, so you know that that probably made it even better. Uh, yeah, and I will quote you on uh, continuity here because I read uh, one of your quotes about continuity, but I will paraphrase it. You said that in your opinion, continuity is damaging the best writers uh, because no, of the worst. The, the, line, the line is, continuity holds the best writer hostage yeah. of the worst. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. And uh, something uh, interesting for our listeners. You were one of the first persons to ever watch Star Wars. Is that right? No, I saw... Uh, no, I wasn't one of the first. Uh, I saw it in an advanced preview, uh, but, you know, um, a couple of weeks before the uh, movie came out, but I wasn't one of the first. In fact, there were yeah. people online who had already seen it before me. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. But I was, th I was thrilled to see it uh, a mm -hmm. couple of weeks early. Yeah. And did, uh, did maybe things like Star Wars happening back then influenced your, your view on the comic industry and how you write or not? I think Star Wars changed everything for everybody who was into uh, the fantasy and the fantastic that we do that we're into. I think what it proved, because there was a there was a legend in Hollywood that science fiction never sold. You mm -hmm. no science fiction movie except for two thousand and one did well, and nobody liked two thousand and one. I did, but yeah, um, Star like Wars proved everybody. Yeah, every Star Wars proved everybody liked it, mm -hmm. and that changed the world. Yeah, and later Blade and first X Men did the same because they were basically first superhero movies to to succeed in every sense, and they they gave birth to stuff like MCU, like DCU. Because uh, yeah. I mean, uh, like you had Batman and Superman before, but everybody yeah. knew Batman and everybody knew Superman, even if they didn't read comics, but you know. X-Men, Blade, we don't know about these characters. You know, general public don't yeah. know about these characters. And now we are getting adaptations of the characters, you know. And minor Guardians and of the Galaxy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. yeah, I believe fans back then when comics were smaller didn't even imagine that characters like uh, Guardians of Galaxy or Ant-Man, Doctor Strange would ever be made into movie, right? I don't think anyone could have uh, predicted what, what's happened. Uh, the Marvel movies really brought in everybody to see it, uh, same way Star Wars had a uh, generation before that. It's, um, it's amazing. Uh, people that you would never, you know, like newscasters will suddenly say, well, my spidey senses say, you know, mm. it's, it's, it's known to everybody now. Yeah. yeah. But one of the things that kind of, like, I, you know, it doesn't bother me, let's say, but, you know, it kind of clicks with me is I see a lot of people who are a fan of superhero movies uh, and enjoy them. And uh, that, I think that's great. Uh, but one of the things that kind of, let's say, bother me is when people don't go out and like you did with the Adventure of Superman, they don't go out these days, I think, as much as should be to look at where that came from. Like, I know many people who love superhero movies, but they never read a comic book, you know? And I, I, I would like if there were more people who watched Superman or Batman or whatever, and like, let me read 
where that came from. I agree with you. I would love to see more. I would love to see it have more impact on the comics. I don't know how to do that. Um, maybe making the books more readable or understandable uh, to people who had not read them before. Not, not to have that continuity, which I don't like. Just make it impossible for somebody to pick up a comic and understand it completely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I uh, went to read uh, the newest uh, Marvel crossover. I don't know if it is the newest still. Uh, Judgment Day, when it came out. And it's uh, the crossover between Avengers, Eternals, and X-Men. And I had to read a dozens of other spin-off series just to know why this happened. And Yeah, that's well, definitely... I think that's... A... You can do series that cater to specific fans... And that makes sense because we are in uh we're an industry that appeals to a very specific crowd. But you have to make it you have to make the story. Uh when I was starting out, the instruction we were told or the information we were told was every comic is somebody's first is first comic. Every issue of a comic is somebody's first. So it, they should be able to pick it up and figure it out easily. They, they'll learn the depth of the character as they go on, but they shouldn't be, what's this all about? I, I, I don't have the time to figure it out. Yeah. 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 I feel that's probably the problem, like, uh, because especially if, we, if a non-comic book fan asks a passionate comic book fan, he will tell you, oh, you need to read this and this and, you know, this happens, this and, you know, uh, you will like, that was, oh, no, I can't yeah, That was one of the things that we try to do with Crisis, because of uh, the company, we we couldn't do it all. But the whole idea was to start DC over again. Because my pitch was uh, that crisis took place in from January to December of 1985. That in January of 1986, all DC comics start over. That was my pitch. That was what I tried to do. I th I still think it would have been the right thing to do, but. Uh, the whole idea was not to make it so convoluted that people couldn't use it as a jumping on point. Yeah, and one of the things that happens these days is also comics now trying to bring fans, they adapt to the films, to what happens in films. And and that kind of bothers me a lot because mm -hmm. like you films should adapt to you. Comics, you know, should be first, you know. We are the source and this is what happens after. Absolutely agree with you. And I have one more question. I know you don't like uh, to talk about what you are up to until your works comes out, but is there an untold story about some of your, how you call them, babies in one interview that I listened to, uh, your characters, you would like to take a pen again and write it down? There's only one. Um... And there's a Titan story I would love to do, but I have no idea if uh, if It'll ever happen. I would like to see it happen. You yeah. know, you write so it. You, you write it, and they will discover it, even if they. <laughs> you know. yeah. And for the end of the interview, we have a little tradition where we where we tell a quote on our uh, language on Montenegrin and translate it to the English. And I choose a quote from our first uh, cartoonist, our first comic book writer, and uh, his name was. <laughs> his name was Andrija Mourovic and quote on our language would be Bibigao sam lukavstvo smjestio sam junake iz stripa na Mars oni su tamo na Marsu rušili kapitalizam niko se nije sjetio, niko ih se nije ticao samo kad se to, deš, uh, to ne dešava na zemlji, ovdje na Marsu može and translation would be I resorted to cunning I placed the comic book heroes on Mars. They were destroying capitalism there, on Mars. Nobody remembered. They didn't care. Only that it doesn't hap happen on Earth, here, it can be done on Mars. Yeah, and it, it was the quote from author that had to fight through censorship of communism and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for the thank opportunity to talk with you today. You take care. Thank we stay genuine, uncensored and unscripted, and we always will, as we have to order our usual. Share us, subscribe us, and stay tuned until the next Wednesday. Iguzo!